what were we just be kind of going over some new contracts um, information um, for the upcoming year. Um, I do have a PowerPoint. Um, I'll be going off of it a little bit, but mostly I'll try to be going um, actually in my um, instance to kind of show you different things. So um, the first thing that we'll probably want to do is uh, making sure that your job calendars are set up before the upcoming year um, for the new fiscal year. Um, again, because um, with the new contracts, um, your compensations need these for calculating um, the days, um, your ODJF workdays, EMIS. Um, so what you want to make sure is you want to go to the core and go to job calendars. And that will, um, this is where you would either, if you have to create new ones for the upcoming year or just add your days. So once you create your new year, um, you want to create one new one for the upcoming year um, or take the one that you have from prior and just add to it. Um, so you can add your, your new days coming up for the new coming fiscal year by just opening, uh, modifying, entering the new start date and end date, which I have done already for my um, upcoming fiscal year and then what it does, and then you can go ahead and put your work days in and then do a mass update. And then if you need to mass update um, some holidays in there, you can also use that for this instance for to do this. So um, maybe September um, 7th is uh, Labor Day. So you can go ahead and you can change that day. And you can change that to a holiday. And then that would change, um, should change, mass update, come on. Oh, sorry, I had August in there. Let's try that again. Oh, and I used the wrong date. Sorry about that. So if you wanted to just do the 9-7, um, maybe your school has two days off. That would be nice. You could do the 8. But if you just needed the one date, um, it should just be the 9-7. So, again, once you get the one whole calendar created for the next year, you can use that to copy. But, again, you might have to use um, create or update other calendars to – so you don't have to modify so many um, if you have a multiple kinds of calendars for different groups, um, pay groups. But once you do have one created, then you can use your copy feature and then go ahead and use that one, one that you had um, updated to for the days upcoming for the fiscal year. And then you can select all your other calendars that you want to copy to using the start and end date. And that way, um, it does it for you and it takes a little less time out. So the ones that are used to classic, um, it's pretty much the same um, idea. And then once you do, um, if you need to change, um, oops, excuse me, wrong one here, mass change. If you need to change um, a date on a calendar, and that's for everybody. So like everybody probably has would have off. Um, Labor Day, um, probably the same time during Christmas. Um, so you can go ahead and change all those calendars at once instead of doing each individually. So you can just put in a date that you need to mass um, to a holiday or if you need to do a clammy or makeup day. So just a reminder that the mass change is there and that is the first one here on the mass change. Um, also with the 615 release, which I believe was coming out today, um, they have um, the job calendar they updated because I know a lot were asking to if they can run job calendar report for like default you want to see a default calendar and they have added that now and also the page break on the new job calendar so now the new um, job calendars will have page breaks if you want them um, I ran a report here's my job calendar that shows um, my default calendar 
so now they are you are able to run um, your blank calendars. So that is that would be that was updated on the 615 when that comes out. So that I just wanted to let you guys know on that one. And then also I have a report um, that shows the page break. If I can get it to work here. There we go. Bring that over here. And now you can do page breaks. And then what it'll do is show one calendar, and then it shows your work days, and then the grand total for this calendar. So just, I think that would be helpful, because I know a lot we're asking for those. Okay. If you need to change a pay group um, for a new contract coming up for the or for um, employees, and maybe they're changing different pay groups, um, you can do that by going under the core and the position. So um, they can do that at this time. So if they need to change that, um, that's where they would need to do that. So the first thing we'll be going under is the report. Um, under processing new contracts and what the features here is um, you have your new contract maintenance so um, this would be if you um, if you want to individually bring in if you need to copy one employee and do a new contract for them um, you can do it that way and also you can do the mass copy which will go through each one or new import but eventually, once you bring in your new imports and your mass copy, they'll eventually all show under here. So the first thing I was going to do, I was just going to go ahead and do like one simple employee. And I was bring in one employee here. And then what you would do is select that employee's compensation. And then you want to make sure you have the new contract. So here's my um, compensation for my new employee. And what you would need to do then is from here, you can um, change the job calendar if need be. You also can put a description in for what is this upcoming year. So if you wanted to say it's the 2020, 2020, 2021 new contracts, you can do that. That way you can keep track when you're on their compensation screen, you can see what comp if they have multiple compensations, you can see which ones or what years these are for. Um, you can also change your label to be, if you use the label, to know what contracts these are. Also, the compensation start date, this would be um, the first day for the employees that they start. So this would be their first day with their W's on their work calendars. And then their compensation date would be the last day of work. And you have to also remember if you have anybody that's stretch paid like teachers over the summer months, they would make sure that they include that full year. Because if you quit at, at like the end of June and you put a stop date, the contract will stop paying and then they won't get paid. So you got to remember that these employees are stretch paid over those five, six weeks. Um, over the summer months, you need to remember to put the last compensation stop date. Um, and it's not the last pay date, the actual pay date of their um, last. You just want to make sure that that compensation stop date is inclusive of the beginning and ending date of their very last pay. So that's what you want to remember. And then you want to go ahead now, if you use the override unit and calculation, you would go ahead and click that at this time. Or you can leave it on checked and it will automatically update when we calculate. Now, if they have retirement hours, you can go ahead and put those in at this time. And then if you have, if it's a different supplemental, but most of them would be non because it's just their regular contract. And then the contract days work and con contract work days, 
These will be updated according to what your job calendar is. So whatever your work days is and what your compensation start and stop date is, it does the calculation for you when, it, when we do the calculation. Now these came over from the contract when we, um, from prior, so if it changes, it will update. Um, now your retirement hours or your regular hours of what the employee works per day. And then you have your compensation amounts below. And these will all be um, added, um, updated every time the employee is paid. And then again, you have your option if you use the overwrite pay per calculation, you can do that at this time too. <clears throat> and then we'll go ahead and enter what the new employee's contract will be for the upcoming fiscal year. And then the pays and contract. Again, this would be depends on if you're semi monthly or bi weekly. And then if the employee is stretch paid, which this employee is a teacher, so this would be a stretch paid employee. And then your historic for your calendar start date, again, this is just left as is, so we won't touch that, and the calendar start date isn't entered until the employee is no longer being paid on this job. Now, at hey, this Andrea, time... Um, Andrea, Andrea, yeah. we have a chat question. Let's, oh. let's, let's go ahead, because I think this might be important to everybody, so... Okay, uh, well it says, I need right clar right clarification on the number. Okay, um, it says I need clarification on the uh, start and stop dates. So the contract gets paid the first pay of September through the last pay of August, but the first work days on the new contract is day 15. How will that work and what should the start and stop dates? Okay, so what you would need to do if the first, if the new contract starts on 815, then your old contract needs to stop on 814. As long as that 814 is inclusive in that last pay because you said the last pay, uh, the first pay is in September. Uh, let's say they pay uh, semi-monthly and the uh, last pay is um, 831. That's the stop, that's the actual pay date? That's the actual pay date of the last oh. pay for a pay period of 815 to 831. But that okay. whole pay period actually is days earned toward the new contract but the new contract is not paid until the first pay of September. So 9-1 is when the new contract should start? The work, the first work day is 8-15, but the first pay day is 9-15. Okay. That, okay, Mary, what is the old contract? Yeah, what what's are, the old contract? Is the ending the, of the old contract? The end of the old contract. The last pay is eight thirty one, and the pay period for eight thirty one is eight fifteen to eight thirty, or eight thirty one. But you're saying that their new contract starts on eight fifteen, but the old one is still processing. Is that what you're saying? Their because it sounds days, like you're saying yes, eight fifteen to eight thirty one. Right, their work days start on the new contract, 815, but their old uh -huh. contract is still being paid until 830 or 831. Okay, so in that instance, Mary, what it sounds like to me, because in reality, most times uh, districts will use like the day, be day before the new, their new contract starts, but in this instance, it sounds like we can't. So <clears throat> what I'm thinking the district is gonna have to do, <clears throat> excuse me, is create new job calendars for the new calendar year. So basically, they're going to be creating the job calendars for eight or for 2021 and the start date of 815 to 831. Now, so the you're saying they have to create a new calendar case, every they're year? They're actually going to get paid on the old contract and the new. Uh, they don't they're want paid have on the to the way that they're set up because there's no, they don't want David, paid on I'm the sorry. new. This is where they've always done purge ahead and they've mm -hmm. done purge ahead 
where it calculated the earning and the days on the new contract, but only paid off the old. Or they adjusted okay. it with um, uh, additions in uh, INI Cal mm -hmm. to adjust the start and stop dates. Mm -hmm. So that's where I didn't know if the calendar stop date on the compensation record would tell the old compensation, this is when to stop, and the calendar start and stop dates on the new compensation would tell the new compensation when to look at the calendars. Um, that's where I'm very confused with the explanation yeah. of the compensation start and stop dates. And um, this is very typical. This is not something unique to us. Um, right. And um, we have somebody else said the same thing. It's very typical because of the payroll lag. Um, we're probably going to have to double t check it with Mark, but I know at one time we had talked about it and because we're using the period beginning and ending dates of the old contract to pay that off, basically, let's say, and then if the new contract starts on 8-15, um, that's a, it's a problem because in reality, the way I understand it and the way the system is going to be working, if you use 815 through 830 and you have those days on your calendar for your old contract and your new contract, it's going to pay the new contract. And the other problem we're going to run into is if they put 815 through 830 as work days on the August calendar, it's going to add those days to the old contract. So I think that's going to be a very big problem. And I mean, like I said, the only remedy I know of is if they could, they have, they'd have to create new job calendars for every year. Um, let, let me talk to Mark about that and we'll see. We, we do have another chat. Couldn't this be solved by making the pay period the actual days work in the period instead of false dates that run up to the pay date? Um, I can, quite this sure is Marsha and Becca. Dave, because if you're, yeah, yes, Marsha, go ahead. Lori, what we have told our districts um, is to build their calendars. Can you hear me? Yes, yep, yeah, I can hear you. Okay, so what we told, we have told our districts, because we didn't know what else to do about this, is to mm -hmm. build their their calendars except for the calendar that affects the last pay in their contract. So like that August, <clears throat> the month of August, we're telling them to just don't build it. I'm, I don't know what else to do. I'm, we're not gonna create new calendars for sure. And, but um, that was the resolution that we had and we told them just to leave their new, uh, their new contracts in maintenance. And I was hoping to get different information here <laughs> and um, then just activate them as the other contracts are finished paying out. So I, I'm hoping that there's a different resolution. They weren't excited about that, but I don't know what else to do. Yeah. And then and we the would have to do additions. Uh, yeah. yeah. Then you would have to do additions on the first pay of your new contract to get those yep. earnings yeah. and work days. You would calculated you, you did and i tested yeah. the calendar stop date and it doesn't work okay okay so that's the only thing that i knew to do that was clean and easy and um mm -hmm. even if you leave them in new contract and maintenance because i tested this when you add those calendars in it puts the days automatically into the contract work days you don't right. have to do anything I, else except just verify. Right, but the problem, yeah, and the problem being, if you did it, if you did the calendar before you did that last pay on the old contract, it's gonna put those days in your contract work days because it's looking at that calendar now there's W's on the calendar. Well, maybe they have 184 days listed on there as days work. If you added 815 through 830, 
for the new contract. It's going to actually take those days and put those that say there's 10 days. It's going to add that to 184. And that's not that's not right because that would mess up the advance. So that's definitely a problem. Um, I mean, I understand right. what you're saying. If you just leave the new contracts in new contract, don't create the well. You have to have the calendar out there because obviously you got to pay on the old, but don't put the work days in but until leave it blank. after that last right. pay on the contract. But like uh, Mary said, yeah, you'd leave a blank. But the, the, like Mary said, in order to pay the new contract, you'd have to pay that on the, on the next payroll and use additions in order to pay it correct. correctly. Lori, in because classic- the way it sounds, Mary, you're saying that, that yeah. In classic, we had the purge ahead. Yes. So we could um, pay off the old contract, the last pay of August, and yes. um, purge the new contracts, and the work days and accrued would calculate on the new contract new. only. It would yes. not affect any days or anything on the old contract the new contract would have the earnings, but it would not pay on it. And so that was a question that uh, Carrie had asked at the um, uh, uh, FYE uh, close and um, wasn't sure that her question was understood correctly if doing the purge mm -hmm. ahead would work the same way in redesign as what it does in classic. That it would only pay on the right. old, but it, it on the it new. Won't. Okay. It, yeah. As far as I know right now, it will not. But we may have to tell Mark that that needs to be fixed. I mean, we've talked to the, the programmers about this. And more or less, they were like, well, they're just going to have to use the day before the, you know, the new contract starts as the stop date. And then the new contract start date would be the next day, but it's not doing what classic did. Like you said, like it actually pulled in, say that there were nine days on the new contract. It pulled in the work days, but it put it all in accrued wages. It was basically earnings, but it put it all accrued. Right. And, and the redesign, I do not believe it is doing that. So, I mean, we need to address that problem because we're going to have a lot of new contracts. And I know there are a lot of districts that are on a two week lag. So, and with, with your scenario that you just gave us, that's, that's a, that's going to be a problem because if you're wanting, well, I'm trying to think about this. Well, and it's not necessarily a two-way lag. It's the way that their contracts are set up and the way that their pays are and the fact that um, mm -hmm. with districts starting their employees earlier and earlier, yeah. the teachers yeah. are working most of a full pay before they're actually getting paid on their new contract, right. but their contract pay terms are set by negotiation agreements usually right and the, and the problem is it's not like we can say okay well end the old contract on 814 and we're but the problem we're, we're having there is we're not including any of the work days for the new contract that would actually have to be on the next pay, which you're saying that, oh, excuse me, that would have to be on, on the 831 pay as far as like the new contract. You're saying really, in reality, the old contract and the new contract should both be looked at on the 831 pay. Is that what you're telling me, Mary? Um, as far as paying off the old and accruing days on the new yes yeah yeah okay that's that's no what pay i on the new. that's right what I am. but no pay no on the new exactly contract. exactly mm -hmm. yeah exactly yeah let me let, let us talk to the programmers i'll talk to mark about it and we'll see if he has some sort of a solution on that um 
and then I will send out a message to everybody and let you know what, what was determined. Is that okay? Yes. Okay. All right. Yeah, we'll go ahead and do that. All right. Is there any okay, other questions? Andrew, keep going. Sorry. Oh, no, that's okay. <laughs> I know we have a lot of questions on those dates, so those are good questions. Um, um, the other thing um, we're going to just to make sure that if you wanted to update your salary schedule, because we don't have that option like we did in classic, um, to so you can, if you need to update this every year because you just keep track of what schedule they're on, um, you can do that right here also and update that. Um, again, and then if this is a reportable to EMIS, you want to make sure that is checked also. So once that is done, you can go ahead and you can calculate. And then it updates your paper period and your unit amount. And also gives you your work, your work dates according to your compensation um, start and stop date. So go ahead and save that. And again, if you need it to start over, um, you can go ahead and press the clear and then you can re-enter and calculate again. So then once it's in there, you can go ahead and select it and you have the option to activate it. And that's kind of like classic, but um, purging. Um, so we're gonna go ahead and activate the new contract over into compensations. So we'll go ahead and activate that. Um, we do have a new option here. Is the lock in per pay so what that is, is um, when you're activating, you can actually select that box now, the override paper period calculation um, for all the employees now, if you use that. Um, so you don't have to worry about um, doing a, I think it was a mass change procedure we had to do or before um, in new contracts before you purge them. Um, this was added, um, I, can, I don't know if this was a 614 or was, if it's coming, I think it's, I think it was a 614. Um, so now you have the option to either click that override paper period calculation in the new compensation right away when you're activating and whoever selected, those will all be, um, and it will lock in that pay. Or you can unselect it and then it will use just the, the calculation of what the system calculated for you. So mine, I didn't have that lock-in per pay, um, so I'm just gonna leave it as is. And then if I go to compensations, you can see. And my new one, the new contract starts. So then my new contract for a new employee is here and then my description came over and also the label. And then my pay per period override was not checked. Okay. So that is an example of how you can do one person or at a time. Okay. So, okay. So the next thing is the mass copy. Okay. And the other thing I wanted to mention, I guess I go back here to compensation, was on the historical context. I didn't know if you knew was the get that here. Um, it will show down here is what was prior, and it was what their prior um, compensation was. So you can look down here, and this will show what was um, before the purge of, or activate um, what the contract was. So this was from a contract from last year. Um, 
So that is something that they can look at if they need to see. Okay, just wanted to bring that. All right, on to the mass copy. And the mass copy, um, this is where they bring in multiple employees and update their contracts instead of doing one per person. Um, again, you have the option to bring in just your active employees or inactive or both. You also have the option if you have, if you want to include your archive employees. And then the include compensation active start date. This is, um, I was going to go over this a little bit. If you leave it empty, um, then it will bring in all employees. Um, that you have. So I selected my one. Um, so now it brought in all my employees for my um, the black two pay group. But if I put in a compensation stop or date, um, I'm going to put in 8 1 of 2019. And it really um, just selected quite a few of them and only brought in anybody with an 8 1 and before stop or our start date on the compensation. If you want to use the stop date on bringing in employees, um, you want to make sure if I go ahead and I'll leave that blank again. And oh, I have to re, there we go. Go ahead and get my black back over there. And so if I want to enter in anything of, uh, bring in anything with uh, 815 or anything with a stop date of 815. So it does bring in everybody that has um, equal to or after of 815 on the stop date. So if you're wanting to use the stop date to bring in contracts, um, you just have to remember the date that you entered will bring in anything of on that date or after or equal to. I don't have that many stop dates entered, but that's um, just wanted to give you a little scenario of what that um, this compensation active date will do if you're using it as a stop date instead of using it as a start date. So the stop date would be anything um, av, as of, of, equal to, or after, and then the start date would be um, bringing compensations of um, the date you entered plus or before. Okay. So then your contract start date would be the date, um, usually it's the first day for which the job is paid on, and then the contract stop date would be the date um, of the last pay um, the last day that they work. Again, you want to make sure if you're stretch paid to make sure you include the employees um, that through the summer months. Or you can leave them blank and then the, it will just calculate the date of the old, what the old stop date was. So if they had stop dates in here, it would just use that date and it would put in that next very, ne very next um, day. So 815, it should be the 8, 816 for the next start date of your compensation. So I'm just going to go ahead and build the new contract. And we had 89. And then that brought them over into the new contract. And then, like I said, it would bring in, it started the new compensation start date with what the next day was after the stop date on the old compensation was. So now my contract start date is 816. And then from here, you can go ahead and if update each of your contracts for what um, they would need to be, um, enter their calendars, update the information, just like we did normally when we did the one employee would have to do on each of these. And then make sure you would enter your compensation stop date for the upcoming in 2021. So then once you have updated um, all your information in there, 
then you would want to go ahead and select um, your employees to purge. But if you were, if you have multiple um, pay groups in here and you didn't want to purge them all at one time, um, again, you can go by your calendar type um, or you can um, find the pay group and do a selection by that and then activate those. Okay. Okay, can mass change be used to update the pay group with a compensation end date? Um, are you asking about the update the group? Yes. You're asking about, okay, so you wanna be able to change the compensation Compensation end date. So you want to be able to change using the stop date? Okay. You should be able to. I have to bring that in more. And I've got to find the compensation stop date. Yeah. I believe you can. I will have to look into that. I have to look. Uh, Andrea, you should be able to. I think, yeah, actually, I think we have a mass change process out there. Um, I, I'm, I'm looking right now, but I'm pretty sure that we do. That they could mass change that, uh, that stop date on new contracts. And then just I'll look and uh, let you know. I'll tell you where it's at. Yeah. Well, it might not be on here. We might, we might like have it out on that uh, wiki page where we have all the, all the mass flow documentation. I'm looking right now. I'm trying to get into it. Right there. Calendar stop date. Yep. Compensation. Where'd you see that? I think there. Oh, you you weren't in new contract. You were. I'm sorry. You were in compensation. New compensation. Right stop there. date. Yeah, right there. Right yeah. there. So yes. So in the mass load or in the mass change, there is a procedure, and then you can enter in. Um, should be enter in that the compensation stop date. Let's see if I can get it to work. Nope. Give me an error. Date range. I wonder if I put the date range in wrong. Okay. Oh, we will have to look to make sure. Maybe I'm not using the right one for the compensation date range. But it should be. But yeah, we'll have to let you know on that one. I'll write that down for you. Who brought that up? D Dub. Okay, Deb. Okay. I will look into that. Okay, you're welcome. Please stop date. Okay. Um, all right. So once you have that, um, then you can activate all those that are ready to be purged over once that is done. Um, okay. And let's see. The next one we'll go over is import new contracts. Um, most, probably most districts are using this as they're um, creating their spreadsheets and then um, importing them in instead of doing them individually through the new contract maintenance. Um, and I do have a new contract. I wanted to bring that up. We do have an option here under the new contracts under processing. Um, there is a new contract compensation um, report option that you can go ahead and create 
your new contract straight from the compensations and then you would all you would have to do is update the the um, column headers and either of the redesign or the classic will work and I do have an example here this is our Can get it to come down here. Yeah. Oh, that thing is right there in the way. Hmm. Oh, all right. Not working. Oh, there we go. Let's get that out of the way. There we go. So using the compensation report, um, you can actually bring in your individually um, or your employees for whatever pay group that you want to. And this was an example. So if I go to my, my reports and report manager, I already had downloaded that um, file. And now it's in here as new contract compensations. And when I open that up, it, it will list exactly what I had on that spreadsheet. And when you generate the report, you have your report, you can bring in um, employees with as compensation starter stop dates, or you can go by the pay group. So if I would do my pay group two and generate the report, and then it brought in all my employees for my pay group two. So from here, then what you would need to do is take the headers um, and make sure that they match what they say on your contract. So your headers would just need to match these, re um, these fields here for the headers here. So the employee ID would need to make sure that those headers match because when they when we created um, as of right now, the headers don't match what they should be, but you can use this information here to change these headers to be what they need to be. And then from here, you can go ahead and update your employee's um, information, and then we can use that file to import. And again, um, if you're used to classic headers, those also work in redesign. So you can either use the redesign headers or you can reuse the classic. So it's up to you what is easier for you to, to use. Okay. Um, I do have um, one that I was gonna in, import in. And that is new contract. Okay, so I'll go back to reports. So once you have your information all correct or entered. I do have one spreadsheet here that I just have one employee instead of multiple. But all I have in here, here's the correct headers for what I would need for it to pull into when I do my import. And I am updated the employee, I entered their new contract start date, their end date, um, what their compensation description and new description would be. Also, um, we need your pay unit, your unit amount, hours and day, your retire hours, and then, of course, your contract amount and contract application, and then your pays and contract for equal pays. So then I will use this um, contract spreadsheet here for this one employee. And we'll get over here and do import. And I'll go ahead and I will choose that file. Andrea, while you're doing this, um, in yeah. Classic, we were told on the import, um, actually, whenever we were working with new contract, to only put in contract amount and not the obligation and let the system calculate the obligation. Do On your spreadsheet, you had both the contract amount and the obligation. Um, are we to enter in both on the redesign? I, I believe, yes that I did not know that the, you left that blank. Lori, are you, do you know for sure if that is 
that's different than classic now? I I thought we had to have both. I am I'm thinking I am thinking you have to have both. Pretty sure. This is more shit, Rebecca. But we can verify, Mary. Hmm. This. Yes. This is Marsha and Rebecca, and you do not have to have the obligation. It does automatically populate. Okay. Okay. Perfect. All Thanks, right. Marsha. We will You're update welcome. that then in our documentation, so that way, <laughs> okay, Marsha, that, that you guys know. You're welcome. Okay. So then I have my spreadsheet for my, or my employee, I just brought him over into, I can't think of who I had here, Galloway. So now I brought him over and there's my Sean now. So now Sean should be all ready to go um, to, to go over into activate then. So then if I select him, and again, I'll ask you this question every time you activate new contracts, if you want to lock in um, that paper period or if you want to leave it um, as the calculation of the actual um, system calculated. So now I have my new employee brought over. And as you can see, then I have my new contract. Or Sean. Okay. So again, you can do it by just um, processing um, new contracts as a couple employees here and there, or you can use the mass change to bring in mass copy procedure to bring in your employees. Or again, if you use your spreadsheets, again you have that option in new contracts um, to make sure you can use this. But remember that you would have to change your headers. On, on some of those um, column header fields. Okay. Um, let's see. Um, the required fields, just to remember, you have to have your employee ID, job number, contract type. Um, those are those um, three that are needed for that are required. Okay. Um, one other thing, um, what we can do also, if you didn't update like your description or your mass change um, or your label, um, we do have um, where you can update in compensation once it's purged over. If you want to change um, or add your labels at that time, you can do that also um, using the mass change procedure. And like if I want to add 2020 and I want to be able to do the mass change on that and you can actually add your labels at this time for that if you want to do it by the mass change and you would just select the employees that you want to add and then select your description if you type in a few words or letters, it will bring that up for you. Now, if you do a mass change and you're trying to use like 20, 2021 as your new value for your description, it's going to calculate and it's going to do a minus one. Um, I was playing around with this before and I noticed that that does not work. So you would have to actually use the 2021 or just 21. Because if you try to do a 20 minus 21, it actually thinks that it's calculating a figure. Um, and it will do a subtraction. So you can go ahead and just enter and submit. So then those three now have um, the description of 2021. So again, mass chain can be used for changing um, those descriptions if, if that wasn't done prior. Um, for your districts or for your contracts that are non-contract, um, you can either go under and you want to uh, update your non-contracts for the upcoming year. If those have changed, maybe your hours um, for um, your teacher's aides um, or your subs, 
um, that can be done um, either under home or under reports and it's the SSDT and non-contracts mass load. So then from here you can pull in um, all your non-contracts So you don't individually have to go in and change all the employees under their compensation. We actually have this, um, this calculated for you where you can do it in a spreadsheet. And then what you would need to do is just update, find the employees that you want to change because um, it brings in all your non-contracts. So you probably will have to sift through um, which ones that you're wanting to pull in, um, which pay groups or what um, you can do probably by calendar or um, the start, start dates. But once you find out, once you figure out which ones that you're going to update, then you can go ahead and update that information for these employees. And you can change the unit amount. So then once you do that, then you can save this spreadsheet. And then what you want to do is go to utilities in mass load. And then you want to go ahead and find that file that you saved, that non-contract um, spreadsheet. And then the importable entities would be the non-contract compensation. So then you can load that spreadsheet in and then it will update all the prior fields uh, of the unit amount for that for those employees. So if they got a pay raise, then this would be the easier way to do it than trying to do it individually for all your, your subs, if they were um, bus subs or teacher subs. So just a reminder that that is an option out there for your, your con non-contracts to be updated. Okay. Um, another thing that I just wanted to kind of go over is the reminder of the compensation journal, which is located under each employee. Now, these were um, that you can use to either if you have to modify the accrued wages, um, they can use the compensation journal. Um, the accrued wages is a calculated field so that it would figure out the amount earned minus the amount paid is your accrued wages. So if you have to update your accrued wage, you can use the amount earned field if you need to take away or add to. And that will update your amount earned and your amount wages, accrued wages. So it would take from or add to, and then that would adjust your accrued wages. I know we had some um, tickets on that one prior. Um, so I just wanted to throw that out there that if you do need to adjust your accrued wages for something, um, they have to use the amount earned field, and then that will adjust these two fields. And again, you can use this if you need to adjust the pays paid for employee or even the days worked. So just a reminder that compensation um, journal is out there for that. Also, the other thing is the adjustment journal. Um, if you have an employee that maybe was um, got earnings for last fiscal year and they're showing up on this fiscal year's contract or on the SDS advance, um, you can use the journal to remove those figures from the SDS advance fiscal um, report. So what you want to do is the employee select the employee select the employee. That you have. I'll just pick one employee here, and then you would let the you would select the employee's 450 code. Still thinking here. There it goes. Select the 450. And then you're going to want to do the type of total gross. 
and then your transaction date would be the date that you have your posting period open. And then from here, if it was $120 you paid for something at the end of last fiscal year, and it, but it should have been on last fiscal year, so not this coming year, then you can actually do this, and then you can just go ahead and remove these figures and actually do just the fiscal year to date. And what that does then removes that from the STRS advance report. So if you have employees like this, um, this is what you can do and then they would fall off the report and you can make those corrections with um, STRS then for the upcoming, from the prior year. Okay, um, is there any questions on this? I know you had a lot of questions on the start and stop dates and we will definitely get back to you on those because I know a lot of districts um, have different scenarios. So we will look into that with the programmers and definitely we'll get back to you on those. And if you definitely want to shoot us um, open tickets or shoot us emails with the scenarios that you have, um, then we can um, work on those and see what is the best option for your districts. And we will and then talk with uh, Mark and the programmers on that. And we had a question from Dave. Um, if we are migrating a district in July, will data and classic New Hampshire pull and redesign? Yes. They should be able to um, create those and they should pull into new contracts and redesign. Is there any other questions on that? And again, if there's questions that we did not answer, please open, um, send us emails or anything and we will definitely um, help you with those. And Andrea, I did make a call to Mark and we oh, are did. looking into Mary's question regarding okay. those old contract and contract dates and and we're he's going to dig into it deeper. So we will let everybody know what we find out. As okay. Find out. Great. Great. Thank you, Lori. I appreciate that. Thank you, Definitely. Lori. No problem, Mary. <laughs> um, is there any other questions or something that wasn't gone over that you have a question on that we can definitely help you with? If not, um, please, um, again, please let us know. Um, open tickets if you have questions anymore later today. Um, and I guess that will be it for today. And thank you for joining us today. Friday's with Fisco and enjoy your weekend. Thank you.